Welcome to the Multi-Orgasmic Millionaire Podcast, where sexual liberation meets financial empowerment. Join me, Tilly Storm, top 20 sex coach worldwide, on my own journey to becoming a multi-orgasmic millionaire through the mystical art of sex magic, financial savvy, and guidance from my very own mystical yoni oracle. I'm going to reveal how I'm turning orgasms into cold, hard cash. Get ready to dive deep and discover the secrets to living a life of abundance on your own multi-orgasmic terms. Welcome to the show, ladies. I hope you enjoyed that brand new intro to the Multi-Orgasmic Millionaire. This is a really big turning point for me. As you can tell, maybe you have noticed the new artwork on the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Maybe you have noticed that there's a brand new description and that there's brand new music on this podcast. Well, that is because we are completely relaunching the premise of the multi-orgasmic millionaire. For the last four years, I have been on this huge journey of up-leveling and also reinventing as all people who are excellent at their craft and who are authority figures and thought leaders. There's usually this reinvention that happens every couple of years. And I feel like I've been there for a really long time, not knowing what that next step was, that next me was. In January 2020, I changed my name to Tilly Storm. Formerly, I had been, I had a name that went through a couple of iterations because I had been married and divorced twice. And at the point, I did not want to continue to be called that name anymore. And I didn't know what new name that was for me. So I had asked for about two years. And finally, in January 2020, it came to me. And I feel like that was the very beginning of me stepping into that new iteration, that new up level for myself. So then the pandemic started several months later in March 2020. And part of my identity, I feel, has always been very strongly rooted in the rebellious one. I have always been a rebellious woman at heart. That's part of my core identity and something that I've always really felt connected to and proud of based on my family history, being born and raised in a small town in Louisiana and having Cajun roots. And if you don't know anything about Cajun heritage, definitely advise you to go look it up. It's pretty fascinating. But I come from a long line of rebellious people who were all about the fuck it, fuck it. And they didn't give a shit about what other people thought. They didn't care what other people wanted them to do. They were like, nope, this is who we are. If you don't like it, we're out. And that has been a very strong thread in my entire adult life. That if there's a place where I don't feel accepted or acknowledged or relationships is not working for me friend wise i don't put myself in places where people can't handle my rebellious spirit and who i don't feel like i can fully be myself in self expression has never been something i have struggled with and yet i found myself during the pandemic in the early days when they instituted the face mask policy in new orleans where i was living at the time that is when I really started to go into a hole. That's when I felt like I had to shrink who I was to hide who I was in order to be okay, actually, in order to survive and get food and actually go to the store. And and I'm saying this not in a way of, oh, yeah, I, I needed to hide from everyone. No, no, no. The opposite way of this is bullshit. I know what's going on on a greater scale, on a larger level in humanity. and me breathing air isn't dangerous to anyone. So I had a whole problem with it from the very, very start. And during the early days of the pandemic, I was traveling a lot. And then they instituted the face mask on the airplanes. I remember going on the airplanes with my partner. I met him in June 2020. And I remember going on the airplanes and literally like having to hide myself from the The flight attendants who had just become like these rule enforcers, they become like the freaking mask police. And 
I absolutely hated it. I've always had a problem with authority figures. I do not do well when people tell me what I have to do and when people tell me what I can and cannot do with my body. I free birthed my first son. I had my second premature baby in a hospital on all floor for on all fours in the hospital, totally my way. And that has just always been something that's been at the core of who I am is don't tell me what to do. I'm going to trust my body. I'm going to do what's right for me. And if you don't think it's right for you, then we're probably not going to be friends and not get along. And that's like that badass part of me that that part of me that felt like I had to squander that because it actually wasn't safe to be that for a long period of time because that part was going to literally get me in trouble. I have PTSD over the word ma'am at this point. My kids are so funny. Anytime they want to piss me off, they'll just be like, ma'am, and I'll start to freak out inside because all of the mask Nazis during the pandemic that would be like, ma'am, put your mask over your nose. And I would be like, oh, my freaking God, get me out of here. So I don't do well with authority, especially government authority. I was raised by someone who taught me from day one, you never trust the government and don't trust doctors. Doctors are great for emergencies, but usually there's money behind the medicine. From a very early age, I did not buy into certain things that most people seem to buy into when it came to trusting the government, trusting doctors, the whole healthcare system, all of the things. So anyway, during the pandemic, I had this shrinking. Everything about me felt like it had to shrink and hide in order to be safe and to survive. And it really did something to me that I knew it was happening while it was happening, but there was also no way to really be all of me and to be that rebellious part of myself without like seriously having issues with authorities. While I had this shrinking period going on, it it felt like I couldn't be fully me. And I don't know how or why it's taken maybe a year or two to really feel, oh my God, wait, it's actually safe to be fully me, to bring back that badass rebellious part of me that I felt like I had been missing for four years now. And this is this is what it's come down to, is that for the last year or two, I have felt this budding, this reinvention happening and not knowing what that identity in me was, what was missing that didn't feel totally aligned. And just recently, my whole family has been through this crazy housing experience in Florida. So during the pandemic, we world schooled, we traveled for a long time to Costa Rica, Colombia, and Mexico. And my kids eventually wanted to come home and go to an actual school because at the time they didn't appreciate what we were actually doing. They were fine with it, but they didn't like super enjoy it, even though we lived like a block from the most amazing beach in Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where we went surfing every day. They didn't understand or appreciate what their experience was at the time. So we found a school uh, at Montessori High School that in Florida. So we moved to Florida along with so many other people. And that was in January 2022. And we have been there for two years. And each year they have progressively raised our rent by ridiculous amounts of money. And it just became so ridiculous that we're like, okay, we're not doing this. This is just, it's too much. So we left our house. We were going to go to Mexico. We were going to go to Mardi Gras first in New Orleans. So this was the end of January this year. Our lease was up after two years in Florida. And we decided we were going to put everything in storage. We were going to go to Mexico because my kids were like, ah, we realized how awesome traveling was and being in new cultures and learning Spanish and speaking Spanish. Like they they didn't appreciate it then, but then they didn't have it for a while. And now they really appreciate it. And the only thing they want to do is go spend some extended time in Mexico City. So they're like, okay, we're going to go do that. So we came to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. And at the end of January, early February, had a blast with friends. And then we had booked our plane tickets to Mexico City. And literally 22 hours later, my partner gets an email from the city of Hollywood, Florida, telling him that he was accepted into this business incubator thing 
for a small business that he wanted to start it locally there. And it was very surprising. And I was like, okay, so he has to be in Florida every Thursday for three months. And we're like, okay. So that kind of puts a wrench on our plans to go to Mexico City. So then we're like, okay, so I guess we're going to have to put that on pause and we're going to have to get back to Florida as quickly as possible. It is March 22nd recording this episode of 2024. That was like February 3rd. We have been looking for a house ever since then. So it's we've applied for four houses and none of our our offers have gone through. So it's okay, what is the universe trying to teach us here? What are we doing? It turns out that we found a how a rental situation that was so easy, so ridiculously easy here in New Orleans. We had a friend who had a friend who had a house <laughs> where he was wanting to go travel some for a month or two. And he said, yeah, you could totally rent our home for as long as you need. And we're like, okay, so that was really easy. We've been here ever since, and we're still looking for a house in Florida, but it's just become so absurd and ridiculous that it's just, okay, I'm not attached to anything at this point. I have no idea where we're going or what we're doing, but we do desire very much to get back to Florida eventually. So anyway, the whole point of me telling you this is that we had this unexpected extended stay back in my neck of the woods where I'm from in New Orleans, and we've been here almost two months now. And there's been this, I don't know, there's something about this city. I think a lot of people understand that it's a really special place. Many people know New Orleans because of Mardi Gras and Bourbon Street and it's a party all year round and there's a lot of drunk people here and that is all very true. But there's also something about being here that does something to me and my spirit. And I get really connected to my roots when I'm here, which I feel is so important to know where you came from, to know who you came from. And there's something about being here also that just absolutely steals your heart. New Orleans steals your heart. You spend uh, any length of time in New Orleans and you'll see Nola Till You Die flags all over the city. And people will tell you that all the time, that they come here and then they just never leave because it's so amazing. People have a love-hate relationship with this place. It's like one of those boyfriends you had that you keep going back to and you're like okay why do I keep going back to them oh but it's so good oh it's the best sex ever so I'm just gonna keep going back to them that's what this city is like it has that draw it has that pull it's so fun and exciting and it's just so beautiful this time of year this is my favorite time of year here in New Orleans and late winter early spring and anyway so I've connected with a couple of friends from here and we were sitting around the dinner table one night we invited everyone over for dinner and I'm like, okay, guys, what gives? Like, I don't feel incomplete. There's something that's missing with my podcast. And I want to reinvent the premise of it. I want it to be more fun and exciting for me. I started out just doing some interviews on my podcast. I've been podcasting since 2017. I started doing interviews and then some teaching and then People told me that they like my teachings better. So then I just did teaching for years and years. And now I'm like, you know what? I've done so much teaching. <laughs> this is great. But I want something that's exciting to me, that feels aligned and that makes me want to get up in the morning and freaking share and talk about what's happening. And while I love teaching about sexuality and relationships, and it is my passion, there was just something else that I knew needed to come out. And it was that badass freaking rebel part of me that you know what fuck it we're going to talk about something different so my friend I was like okay we're gonna have a brainstorming session on the new premise of Tilly's podcast the multi-orgasmic millionaire and one of my friends she's do you think it's ever in the cards for you to be a millionaire and I was like yeah absolutely like I've got the investments that are getting me there right now like that's happening and she was like okay well, if you're not quite there yet then why don't you make it about your journey to becoming a multi-orgasmic millionaire yourself? And I was like, oh my God, that is exactly the next layer, the next level of this iteration of myself is really stepping in to my millionaire identity. We're calling her Millie Tilly, by the way. Millie Tilly is my millionaire identity's name. 
and embodying that part of myself and taking you all along the journey with me, which I think is going to be super fun because I, my partner is really into financial investment and he has a whole coaching program, the Abundantly Infinite Entrepreneur, and you'll probably be hearing more from him. And we're actually going to be partnering together and putting out a program and that I will tell you about very shortly. But just know that there's something coming that's going to mix sex and money and that this amalgamation, this alchemy of sex and money is really the next iteration for me. And when we were sitting around that dinner table, my friend was like, ah, yeah, this. And then we had all of these other ideas that were so cool that we we're totally going to implement too, but I'm not giving it all away right now. Anyway, I was like, okay, we're going to do this. Yes. You know what the first thing that came up for me, the first piece of resistance was, fuck, now I actually have to commit to becoming a millionaire. Fuck, I have to commit. Oh my God, I was dumbfounded. I was so surprised at how when I claimed the, okay, yep, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. The first piece of resistance and fear was having to commit to a journey that I already said I wanted. I already know is in the cards for me, but to actually have to do the inner work and the embodiment to get there because I know what that inner work and that embodiment looks like. And I know that it takes a commitment. And I was like, oh, fuck, here we go. So the last two weeks have been me putting together my own coaching program, basically of embodiment practices and meditations and sex magic and identity pieces, shadow work pieces that are really required for me to personally step into Millie Tilly millionaire identity. and. All I can say is the last couple of weeks have been very abundant already. So fascinating. And what what has been really reflected back to me in this whole fiasco of putting four offers in on homes in Florida is that I don't fit the typical mold of people applying for homes, right? I'm an entrepreneur. My income is high, but it's very inconsistent. And some months I make tens and tens of thousands of dollars and then some months they don't make but several thousand. So it really fluctuates a lot. And I don't have a perfect past either, as with anyone. When I got divorced in 2018, it took me to the financial ringer, like so hard. I had nothing but $2,000 to my name after selling my house and $30,000 of credit card debt from my ex-husband not uh, working for an entire year because he had lost his job after a really tragic accident that pretty much took our family to the ground. And we were not able to survive that, sadly. So when I started my business in late 20s, I started this podcast November 2017. Early 2018, I started getting my first couple of clients. And it was like a financial disaster for me. And somehow, out of the grace of God, I was able to take my business from nothing to six figures in a little over a year and a half, or no, a little over a year. It was less than a year and a half, a little bit more than one year. And I felt so, so blessed and so grateful. But I also worked my ass off. I worked my ass off. Oh my God, I worked more than anybody in the coaching industry I'd ever seen. Like, single mom, I got two kids to feed. Like, we're making this shit happen. I'm not going to live with my parents. Nope, that's not going to be our story. So I was burning the midnight oil. I was up making social media posts. This is back when they didn't completely ban me, but then they definitely banned me like a year after. And anyway, I've had so many social media accounts be blocked, banned, and deleted. So that's why I don't really focus on it anymore. But at the time I was using it, so I was working my ass off and my financial situation was really terrible. So anyway, some of those things that are on my credit report are still showing up. And I'm like, okay, we're going to fix this shit. We're going to make sure that things are reported accurately. And we're going to make sure that we can move forward things. But part of this interesting housing journey was that it was rec recognizing that people had so many questions about what I do, how I make money, and all of my finances in general, like, what do you do with your money? And I'm thinking, it's all in investments. So like, 
why would anyone keep cash right now? They're like, you make all this money, but where does it go? I'm like, investments? What are you doing with cash in the bank if you have it? The dollar is losing its value more and more every day. If you're not investing that shit, what are you doing? So it was just so funny to see people's reactions to what I'm doing with my money, because let me tell you, the housing market in Florida is absolutely insane. Everything is so competitive. Still, four years later, it's still ridiculous. They want copious amounts of months of rent up front to rent a home. They want they still want four to six months of rent up front. And if you're not going to offer that, then you better have perfect credit and you better have your perfect little W-2s that show you make this amount of money every single month. And if you don't have that, then they're going to want more and more stuff from you because you're considered risky. So anyway, it was just very interesting to see the reflection back to me with this whole housing fiasco because I don't fit the typical mold of putting my money in a 401k having the predictable income. I get this much every single month and I don't have the all of the typical investment strategies. I don't do the typical investment strategies. I do the strategies that the Rockefellers did to make millions and create a legacy for their life. Like I don't do the normal shit. And while I have thought many thoughts and feelings about the Rockefellers, at least they did know what to do with their money. Anyway, I use different strategies and I use, I buy cryptocurrencies and I use index universal life insurance policies, and that is where my money goes. Anyway, it's just interesting that with the whole housing thing, I started to recognize how unconventional my life really is in the eyes of people who are looking just at your finances and don't have any idea who you are. All you are is a number to them, literally. Like, all they know about you is the numbers on a piece of paper, and the certain the kinds of questions that they were at, I mean, I felt like I was being interrogated by some of these realtors and these landlords. It was, it was seriously ridiculous. So having to explain this, I'm like, dude, I'm not here to have to explain every single financial decision I make to you. And if you don't understand it, then what are we doing here? Like, I, it's not my job to educate you on why I invest in certain things that actually make me money and why I don't. So. I wasn't available for that level of interrogation and having to explain myself. So some things just fell through because of that. So anyway, my partner and I were talking about it. We're like, okay, wow, we really do have something unique here. Like we, our investment strategies are very different than what most people do, but our investment strategies also work. And they also mean that I don't have to rely on a bank for the rest of my life. I don't need a bank for a loan. I can take a loan out against myself. And actually, I never have to pay back. I know how to do these things for myself. Anyway, it was just such a, an interesting experience for me to see what the purpose of me being here in New Orleans for two months completely unexpectedly was. And within this two month period, having that opportunity to connect back to my roots, to really claim that inner badass and rebellious part of myself again and in a time where it's actually safe to have that part of me back. So it's felt like a reunion, like a coming home. And with that is the new launch, the relaunch of the Multi-Orgasmic Millionaire podcast. Guys, I wanted to make it to episode 300. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do episode 300 relaunch. And I'm like, I can't wait. There's no fucking way I can wait. There's just no way. So I checked in with my pussy. And she's, yep, we're doing this now, baby, because this is hot shit. This is the shit. Yes. And she was so excited and so turned on about it. Okay, I'm like, okay, I can't not listen to her when her voice is that loud. So this is what we're doing. Anyway, I wanted to update you all on my journey for broadly the last four years, but much more fine tuned to these last couple of months and all that has transpired since. So moving forward, here's what is going to happen. This podcast is still going to be teaching about sexuality very much, but uh, we are also going to be teaching about finances and investments, which is so exciting for me, at least. And, and I hope because I'm excited about it that you will be as well, because I think many of you understand the link between sexuality and money and you understand it's a thing. You don't understand why or how it's a thing. You don't understand how to use your sexuality to unlock financial abundance and financial freedom. 
but that is what we're going to be teaching you how to do. Hell yes. So first of all, if you want to be a part of this journey with me and really actually being able to shape this journey to my own millionaire million dollar investment portfolio, then I want you to download my sex magic practice and join our community and WhatsApp. So we're, we have a WhatsApp group. I have a book club that I also communicate to participants from on WhatsApp, the Erotic Re Explorations, sorry, the Erotic Explorations Book Club and the Multi-Orgasmic Millionaire Wealth Journey are both on WhatsApp. So if you're interested in either of those to be a part of with me and to journey with me on, then I want you to go download my sex magic practice, go sign up for book club, and you can get in the WhatsApp chats for those two things for me. Okay. So what's going to happen in Multi-Orgasmic Millionaire Wealth Journey WhatsApp each month? I contribute 15 to 20% of my income to investments. And each month, I'm going to have you guys vote on which of the investments you think I should put it into. And we're going to report back and see how those investments are doing. And eventually, we're going to see how long it takes for me to grow a million dollar investment portfolio. I have no idea how long that is going to take. It could take three weeks. It could take 10 years. It could never happen. I have no freaking idea. I also have no attachment. I have no attachment to this journey and to reaching the actual goal. This is an intention. It is my intention that I get to a million dollar investment portfolio. But there's a difference between an intention and a goal. And an intention is, okay, yes, this is what I would like to have. This is what I intend to happen. And also, I enter into this intention with knowing that this is what's best for me and for everyone else involved and that this intention will only manifest if it's only best for everyone involved. And I think a goal is more, I don't want to say selfish, but it's more, just, no, we're just going to get there. We're just going to do that. It's a very masculine thing. And I think an intention is a little bit more feminine in a way that it's more it includes everyone's experience. So my kids, my family, like my friends, my immediate community of people, like you guys even, who I am being, what ex what experiences I have affect yours as well because of this podcast and this community that I've built. The non-attachment thing, I also know from being a sex and intimacy coach for seven years that the only way that women get to have the orgasms they want and the way that they want them, and the only way that women experience all the different eight types of orgasms is not because they have the goal to. In fact, this is the first thing I have to work with them when they come into my private and group programs is that they have to learn to drop the goal and to love and accept and have gratitude for what is right now. And that can be the hardest thing for high achieving women who are very successful, who may not see themselves as high achieving or successful, but you are. And the only reason you don't see that in yourself is because you're probably a perfectionist. The way that we get to millionaire status or having a millionaire million dollar investment portfolio, the way that we learn to have a different types of orgasms and whatever way we want and for it to be easier and quicker for us to access orgasm isn't through the goal. You have to learn how to drop the goal. So I hope that my intention and the way that I portray this journey isn't, oh, I'm going to do absolutely everything possible, even if it means other people suffer to get to that goal. Nope, that's not what we're doing here. Okay, that's not what I'm going to do here. It's very much just setting that intention that I do intend to have a million dollar investment portfolio. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but yes, I want to buy a house in the French Quarter that costs a million dollars right now. <laughs> yes, that is a goal of mine, and I want to buy it with freaking cash. <laughs> so I'm going to show you on this journey how I am turning my sexual, my connection to my sexual energy, how I am turning my sexual mastery and the tools and the techniques that I am using on myself, I'm going to show you how I'm going to turn that to cold hard cash and actually buy that house in the French Quarter, buy that penthouse in Medellin, Colombia, because my boyfriend is one quarter Colombian and his dad is Colombian and lives in Colombia and it's a beautiful place and we love Medellin. 
and how, yeah, I probably want to buy that house in Costa Rica one day too. Anyway, I hope you'll join me along for this ride. I'm going to be reporting on a couple of different things. First of all, my mystical Yoni Oracle is a PG term, so I don't get in trouble by the powers that be who listen into podcasts. And if I actually start to use social media regularly again, I can't use the word pussy. I don't call my pussy Yoni, personally. I call it pussy, but I can say that on the podcast. I just can't write it in places. So like my emails, any social media posts, the podcast description, I can't put that word in there or I'm probably going to get flagged and told slapped on, get slapped on the hand and maybe have my accounts blocked, banned, and deleted again. So we're going to be PG and just call it my mystical Yoni article. I think that's very spiritual and Woo woo, whatever. It's it's a great term. I like the term, but it's just not what it's not my preference. I like to call my pussy pussy. I'm gonna be checking in with her. If that sounds crazy to you, if it doesn't make sense to you, if you're like, what are you talking about? This chick is gonna check in with her mystical pussy oracle. Yep, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So it might not make sense to you, but what it means is that because of my connection with my body and my sexuality and the work I've done previously for the last 13 years around my body and sex, I do have a very deep connection with my pussy. And I know that my cervix is the seat of my soul. That if I want connection to God, all I got to do is feel into my cervix. Because that part of me is the deepest. It is me. It is me. It is God. It is the God in me. And I want you to be that connected to your pussy and your cervix that you have that direct connection to God yourself. Forget going to the motherfucking priest who doesn't know anything about your body. Forget going to outsource that shit from other people. That's the thing that with religion I have a problem with. When you have to outsource your own intuition and instinct and inner knowing to someone else then it's not your intuition, instinct, and inner knowing. You're giving away your power to someone else. And I want your finances to be that way. I want your sexuality to be that way. I don't want you outsourcing your finances to people who think they know better and who also make money off of doing that for you. I don't want you outsourcing your pleasure to a partner who doesn't know your body in the way that you do. So that's what empowerment is, recognizing that I don't need to outsource things. I don't need to outsource my pleasure. I don't need to outsource my finances to someone who thinks they know better. And that is the badass part of me. That is the rebel inside of me. I didn't need to outsource my birth journey to a doctor. Even when I had a premature baby who was born at 32 or 33 weeks, God, I can't even remember anymore. I knew I needed to go to the hospital. I went to the hospital, but I didn't let that doctor tell me how to birth my baby. He tried to get me to get on a bed and I laughed at him. I freaking laughed at him. I said, ha ha ha, I birthed my babies on all fours on the floor, motherfucker. So if you need someone to come in here and catch my baby other than me, then you should probably go do that right now. And that's exactly what happened. They had the midwife come catch my baby. Even then, you don't outsource your own inner knowing and connection to body and source to someone else because they don't know. And I want that empowerment for you in all areas of your life. So That is what this podcast is going to be about, your sexual empowerment, your financial empowerment, and merging the two. And I'm going on the journey with you, baby, and I'm going to show you everything that I'm doing that's got me where I am because it's not I have so far to go, but I'm getting there. I'm on the way, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy the ride. I hope you enjoy this badass side of me. I hope you enjoy this rebellious part of me that I feel like I'm just reuniting with, that I feel like I've missed her for a long time. I'm very excited that she's back. I hope you like it too. And others of you, I know you're not going to like it and that's okay. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to please anybody. I'm doing what feels good to me and what's exciting for me because I know when I do that, I'm going to attract the perfect people into my world that make all of our lives better and more high vibration and more connected and more beautiful and more loving and more peaceful and joyful and all of the good vibes. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember to go download the Sex Magic Practice is brand new. I just put it out there for everybody. There's a solo and a couples one. And when you opt in with your name and email, you'll get the link to my WhatsApp community 
so you can help me along on the journey. All right, we'll see you soon. Bye.